In this episode of Art Loft, ICA Ideas program, Eileen Miles. An ICA Ideas where we invite creators, artists, theorists to respond to the exhibition on view at the ICA Miami. Shannon Ebner as a public character was a perfect platform for poet and writer Eileen Miles to come in and explore Shannon's look at the world through visual imagery, poetry, performance, and video. I guess I'm very attached to the small boats moving across the deep blue sea in a world much older than ours, but maybe the same, it speaks to me. The smallness of the boat, the bigness of the night. The shot is wide and I somehow feel close. Kirk Giddings documents forgotten and abandoned places. So sometimes I'm making um, a series of images. Uh, one of those will always be the one that has the magic in it. One of the things I found most very intriguing about the landscape is that it seems to me to be alive. Colleen McCullough's collages take on a life of their own. Most of the time I feel as though I am taking parts and pieces of an image that need to be together and finding a home for them. And because of that I don't become too attached to the work. I tend to see it as something that exists in the world beyond me after I make it. It's all ahead in this episode of Art Loft. Funding for Art Loft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys in Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece. Hi, I'm P. Scott Cunningham. And from the studios at South Florida PBS, this is Art Loft. Welcome back. I'm P. Scott Cunningham. In this episode of Art Loft, we're encountering unforgettable projects in performance, collage, and printmaking from around the world. First, we return to the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami and their profile on the renowned poet, writer, and critic Eileen Miles, author of the cult novel Chelsea Girls. Miles has received a Guggenheim Fellowship in Nonfiction, an Andy Warhol Creative Capital Grant, and the Poetry Society of America's Shelley Prize. Her poetry is a familiar feature in the groundbreaking, Emmy-winning TV series Transparent. In her presentation at ICA Miami, Miles engaged museum visitors for a lively night of poetry, prose, and some candid personal history, both profound and humorous. The Institute of Contemporary Art Miami has a series of public programs free to the public at no charge. ICA Speaks, which is where artists come in and talk about the works in our collection. ICA Performs, where we invite a performing artist into Miami to create new work and give the public some insight into that creative process. And then ICA Ideas, where we invite creators, artists, theorists to respond to the exhibition on view at the ICA Miami. Shannon Ebner as a public character was a perfect platform for poet and writer Eileen Miles to come in and explore Shannon's look at the world World through visual imagery, poetry, performance, and video. Please enjoy some highlights from Eileen Miles at ICA Ideas at the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami. Hi, you guys. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, I'm going to, um, it might be heavy on the poetry, so I, for those of you who don't love poetry, this is going to change your minds. <laughs> You, I think so. I had a whole month of being madly in love. I mean, you know, you don't stop it. This is just, you don't stop it, but it's like a month where you can't believe this drug. This is the greatest. <laughs> you, I'm bravely eating my croissant at everyone. I'm living on my wet board. I'm living on my money. Limits set and the lights lower. I worship the blue marks on the hydrant. How like the name of a flower. <laughs> Television. I guess I'm very attached to the small boats moving across the deep blue sea in a world much older than ours, but maybe the same, it speaks to me, the smallness of the boat, the bigness of the night. The shot is wide and I somehow feel close. I want to speak this enormity to you, I feel like that, or I sing like that, that not, 
or I sing like that. Not modern, or it's like weird when you can't read your own. It's like, what does she mean? I feel, like, I feel like that, or I sing like that. Not modern or loose at all. I'm loose like a tiny boat in a wide cove, opening out into a bigger water, a, wa a bigger body of water. I relish the small ripples like lines that hold my boat. It's so quiet in the morning. I imagine myself seen, and what's seeing me is a forlorn love. Can you understand this at all? It's kind of lost in a color or a tone, something really old and bound up with everything in the moving picture. And then I am gone. It changes into day or a cartoon. But for the stretch of that voyage, I am known. So that was kind of a combination of watching the Emmys and then Game, Game of Thrones. <laughs> You know, you get a new computer and you're enraged that you have to teach it all the same and you were like, come on. So, this is you. After all these years, you should know my font. You should know the numbers go in the middle. What I say, there's so many of you. Why don't you talk each time I have to click and press? What's the use of being famous? <laughs> this one's called Kitchen Holidays. The kettle whistling. And I'm peeling an orange. I'm going to finish in the air of this wild horn. And I splash the boiling water into the French press, splattering water, splashing grains. I'm such an oaf. I wanted to be here with you. It's weird when you're moved by your own work. <laughs> Sometimes I cry. It's incredible. <laughs> So I'm, I'm a New Yorker and I've started, I bought a house in Marfa, Texas, which is, I mean, I'm in love with the West. Like years ago, I, I taught in Missoula, Montana, and I was like, the West. It's like not LA West, like the West, you know? So this is a poem, it's called Western Poem. Purple clouds, my doubts. Iridescent cream, my loss. Purple mountains, my friends. Buzzards circling overhead, my hopes. Birds singing, jagged singing, my indecision. Wrecked skinny tree, my past. Photographs I sent home, my indiscretion. I love you, that's good. <laughs> Amber street light, my reading. My appetite, my appetite. Red striped sky, my confusion. Bright yellow gray sky, my ardor. Car lights, my commotion. Telephone pole, my wishes. Stop sign, my fear. Family dollar, family dollar. <laughs> Courthouse, my opinion. Black cloud, white sky, hesitation. Black cloud, white sky, bliss. Blinking signals, my intentions. Black mountains, too many suggestions. Skipping white lines, my attention. A young cowboy first saw the lights. A young cowboy first saw the lights. The horns on your van, my defensiveness. That old train, my dreams. That old train. Um, so this, I'm going to read a little teeny piece of the Shannon. What did you say? Tell me. I think we'll ever go to Marfa. We've talked about Oh, you've got to go to Marfa. The, well, the thing is, you either get the private jet, which I've never done, or, um, or you, drive, you fly to El Paso, and then you drive for two and a half hours through the high desert, but it is so beautiful. Like, you get to Van Horn, and you're like, oh, my God, it's just like... Like that, and then there's great burritos right there in Van Horn. So. <laughs> so the essay, the Shannon essay is called Passing A, and I'm just jumping right in. So you just look at the show, whatever. And Shannon's like, she's an old pal. I love Shannon. I accuse Shannon Ebner, uh, Ebner of needing to write a big poem on the city. Her laureate composed a moment, and that's that. And again, here's how the end played. She pasted the A's all over the place for a year. Tore them down, but her, her photographer made a record. And then on June 4th, 2015, that flip book of them filled the underpass. Her vaudevillian linguistic Jew project ended right there on the high line. I take, I'm not Jewish, but I take it as an honorary Jewish thing. So I hope that's cool if you're Jewish. You're like, what is she saying? I'm a Jew. <laughs> it's like right there on the high line. It's wonderful to remember how it once was an old industrial railroad within the city, a crusty old thing that haunted everyone for years. Everybody pointed at it at least once. Who will get this thing? And what will they do with it? <laughs> Chris. 
What is your editing process like? Are you constantly editing things even after they've been published and sort of like putting old things with new things or no? Is it like it's a done deal after it's Yeah, no, once published? it's published, because I feel like you just have to move on on mm -hmm. some level and I feel like in order to write new things, I have to regard those as sort of dead in the water in a way, you know? Um, but sometimes I've written something where it, it, it crops up in several places, like the, 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 the context can shift, so I can use the same piece of writing and several books and stuff like that. But mostly I feel like editing, sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's waiting a lot, you know? It's sort of like, because the thing is, is like really alive at a certain point, and then you just sort of need to have, like I think of it in terms of temperatures, like you need to let it cool down so you can move the pieces a bit, you know? But I mean, I, I once in a while I'm really lucky too, and something just comes out. You were like, holy shit. you know? It's just like, it is there, you know? And that's just like grace, you know? But usually it's patches of that. Like I think you you start a novel, you write like ten pages, and you're like, oh my god, this is gonna be so easy, you know? <laughs> and then you write piles of garbage for a year and a half, and you're like, and then and then you get the next thing, you know, almost because you went someplace else and something else happened, you know. So I think with with large longer works, the the nature of the waiting is different, you know. Like you have to write a lot of words to get to the place where you write the thing. So yeah, thank you. I tend to see it as something that exists in the world beyond me after I make it because these aspects of it existed in the world before me. One of New Mexico's finest landscape photographers, Kirk Giddings, finds a sense of presence in abandoned and unpopulated places. Here's a look at his work from New Mexico PBS in Albuquerque. My biggest struggle when I go out to photograph is to become uh, in the moment so that I can see and feel what's happening around me. You don't always know what you're looking for, but when it happens, you know that it just happened. It's less intellectual than it is physical. There's a relationship of landforms and light and shadow and, and rivers and things. And when you see them, that you can feel it in your body, that it kind of makes some kind of sense in a rectangle, in the rectangle of a photograph. And then, then I set up a camera, and then I try to focus in on that, and then I wait, and then I contemplate, and I think about the history that has moved through this landscape, or the mythology that's attached to that landform. I, I care uh, hugely about composition. I oftentimes photograph on the edges of storms where there's rapidly changing light. Um, and, and within the difference of a minute or two, the whole uh, composition and stuff can change because the light and shadow on the, of the clouds and stuff can change. So sometimes I'm making um, a series of images. Uh, one of those will always be the one that has the magic in it. One of the things I found most very intriguing about the landscape is that it seems to me to be alive. Even things that are not life forms, like a landform can be alive. It kind of uh, has a personality to it. A good example is Hakona Cliffs. 
25, 30 years ago, uh, driving by there, it kind of spoke to me in a way. It's, it has, it's like this backbone of some ancient dinosaur. And I just, it has this kind of energy to it. And I thought, I'd really love to get a great photograph of that and show how it really comes alive. So I spent nearly 25 years pursuing that photograph. It took me a decade to figure out uh, what the point of view was that I wanted, and then another 15 years of bad transitional light or whatever, it just didn't work. Until one time I went there, there were powerful clouds blowing through on the edge of a storm. Nothing was happening. I started to take the camera down. I turned around to the car, I turned back, and it was illuminated. This shaft of light had just come through and just illuminated that backbone of the Hakona Cliffs. And it just came alive. And it came alive visually the same way that I had been feeling about it for all these decades. I grew up on the far west side of Albuquerque. Around us was these massive, desolate spaces. with San Diego's on one side and Mount Taylor on the other side. That enormity of space kind of informed how I view the world. It was like being alone in this landscape, this huge, massive landscape that I did not find intimidating, but I made friends with it. And my friends and my brother and I wished to explore these these landscapes and find things of interest, things to do. So now when I'm in these landscapes, I still carry that interest with me. I carry that affection for these broad spaces. I'm comfortable in them. But now what I'm looking for is imagery, imagery that reflects this relationship that I have with these big wide spaces. There's a lot that I've learned, that I've experienced, that I feel I have a responsibility to share. At my heart, I am probably as much an educator and a preservationist as I am an artist. I have seen in my lifetime truly beautiful, extraordinary landscapes in New Mexico get ruined by a power line running through it or a new highway running through it. And I would hope that my uh, photography would help to educate people about the preservation of some of these beautiful historic landscapes. and they really kind of gravitated towards the rain. We wanted to incorporate the scene from Kyoto uh, with the cup and kind of the pebbles and the rain. We all found that that was kind of a really pinnacle point. In this segment, we meet Dayton, Ohio artist Colleen McCullough. After a five-year hiatus from art making, McCullough created her first collage out of old magazine clippings and shared it on social media. This turned into a daily practice, and McCullough has now created and shared a brand new collage every single day for three years. Think TV brings us this profile. A lot of my work is funny. A lot of my work is weird. It's kooky, it doesn't really make sense. It's kind of jarring, and I like that aspect of work that surprises me and that I make things and I say, that's really creepy. That's really weird. When I create a collage, it feels like magic. I know that might seem really cliche. It is a process that is hard to describe. It is very intuitive for me. Most of the time I feel as though I am taking parts and pieces of an image that need to be together and finding a home for them. And because of that, I don't become too attached to the work. I tend to see it as something that 
exist in the world beyond me after I make it because these aspects of it existed in the world before me. Every day I get up, I sit at my desk and I make a collage and then I post them online. The pretty important part of my process is sharing them every day. It's kind of become a performative aspect of opening them up to the world and letting everybody see what's been on my mind that day. I love the practice of it. I love the process of it. I love sitting down and not knowing what's gonna happen and figuring it out. And I really like putting things together to make a larger whole. The process is very meditative. It's a time in which I can quiet myself and focus. And there's a lot of joy in that. The length of time that it takes, it varies from day to day. Some days it takes a half an hour, start to finish. Sometimes it takes eight hours. For a while, I was convinced that it would take however much free time I had. I have had a consistent daily practice for over three years now. I know that seems like a very long time in the span of a daily action, but it doesn't feel as though it's been that long at all. I think the biggest challenge is staying focused and staying committed because crazy things happen in life and I try and be very kind to myself and recognize that some days I'm gonna have work that I am more happy with than other days. So I started these daily intentional actions after I kind of went through a pretty big health struggle in my early 20s. Growing up I had a lot of pain in my legs and I was told that I would be in a wheelchair by age 25 and so I felt as though I had a timeline of things that I needed to accomplish before then. It was increasingly a painful experience and I ended up using a walker and wheelchair briefly for some of my college years until I found out that I had been misdiagnosed. I found out that I had been misdiagnosed with an illness um, that had really changed my life and my quality of life. It was extremely freeing and liberating to feel as though the world was open to me and at the same time it was extremely terrifying to not know who I was without that illness and that I think was a big transition. The realization that the world and the life that I thought I was going to have would be different set a different course to the way that I chose to live. So I just decided every day I'm going to do one thing <laughs> no matter how big and I'm going to just see where it takes me. I'm not gonna judge it, I'm not gonna apply any sort of critical eye to it, I'm just gonna go with it and see what the collection of those intentional actions will, will be. It's never, it never ends, I could do this for approximately 1,000 collages. I explore a lot of different concepts and work through things in ways that I don't even realize until I kind of take a step back and look in retrospect at what I've done the previous weeks and months. Yeah, there's a lot of themes that I find recurring in my work. A lot of my work is figurative. There's a hybridization between nature, human, and technology. I'm very inspired by movement, by gesture, and I'm also very influenced by the female form and the way that it is used and fictionalized in media. I find myself interested in removing those from their context and recontextualizing them. And I think taking those images and kind of twisting them in a way that can be humorous and playful and really begin to speak about the way the images and media and the way that we interact with them is kind of the overarching theme of all of my work. The choice to share my work on social media is no mistake. I'm not saying I'm trying to change the world, but I'm very interested in the idea of using collage to begin to provoke thought to subvert social media and these images that we kind of just mindlessly scroll through and mindlessly take in. I'm interested in creating something that creates a pause, creates a moment that maybe things seem a little off and it begins to open your mind to expand what else you see beyond that image. It is not that I am creating it, it is that for a time I get to allow something to happen and then put it out there. And that is the most fulfilling part. And the fact I get joy out of it is even better, you know? So that's it.
Thanks for joining us on Art Loft. You can always connect with us on social media at Art Loft SFL and watch us anytime on the PBS app by selecting WPBT2 as your local station. For Art Loft, I'm P. Scott Cunningham. See you next time. Funding for Artloft was made possible by Friends of Art and In the Florida Keys and Key West, every night is a spectacular show. And every day is another masterpiece. <laughs>